Hello and welcome to our worship for the 2nd of June 2024. We're glad you could join us. My name is Julia Walsh and I'm leading our worship today from Bulgaria. Due to the wonders of technology, which most of us take for granted nowadays. The psalmist wrote, saying to God, It was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Let us come to God today with our hearts and minds full of the same confidence and praise. For we too are made and called by God. Let us pray. Open our minds, O God. Open our hearts, O Christ. Open our souls, O Spirit that we might hear your call afresh, respond with enthusiasm and commitment, working together to build your kingdom. To your praise and glory. Amen. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. Psalm 139 verse 14. Let us pray. Listening and all-powerful God, we come before you now. We want to see you with our eyes, hear you with our ears understand you with our minds, love you with our hearts. We open ourselves before you. We long for a deeper experience of you in our lives. Lord God, you spoke to Samuel in the middle of the night. He needed Eli's help to hear you. 
but you persisted till he heard. Lord, you speak to us sometimes directly. The middle of the night is good. Sometimes through others, and that can be equally unexpected and amazing. You speak, you persist. Where would we be without you, most patient Lord? For the times we only listen with half an ear, if that. The times we are the one being called, but we're just not open enough to hear it. Forgive us, Lord, and open our ears to your wisdom. For the times we doubt something is your word to us, because we're not tuned into you, or perhaps because it comes from an unlikely source. Forgive us, Lord, and open our ears to your wisdom. When we don't give people the benefit of the doubt, when we think they're too young, too old, too different. Forgive us, Lord, and open our ears to your wisdom. For the times we might give wrong advice, not because we want to, but we don't hear you clearly enough. Forgive us, Lord, and open our ears to your wisdom. Now let us imagine the Lord standing before us, arms outstretched, forgiving us, and spend a moment silently thanking God for the power in that forgiveness. Thank you, God, for your blessing and that we can be made as new. Nothing is hidden from you. And if we acknowledge that and confess our sins, we know you will forgive us and lead us further into you. Lord God, we thank you for speaking to Samuel and for speaking to us. We thank you for the Eli's in our lives, how they point us to God and listen even when the message is uncomfortable. Thank you for each one of us here today listening. We are open to you and each other and can do great things in your name. Amen.
face Fashion with purpose Designed for his praise You The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And it came to pass, when Eli was laid down in his place, the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel. Here am I, for thou callest me. I called not. Lie down again. Samuel. Twice more Samuel heard the voice and went unto Eli. Here am I, for thou didst call me. Samuel, go lie down. If he calls again, say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Samuel, Samuel. Speak, for thy servant heareth. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And all Israel knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So what do we know about Samuel, and why is he so important? Well, Samuel was a Levite from the descendants of Kohath. He's one of the few biblical characters to have a detailed birth narrative. So we know his parents were Hannah and Elkanah who lived in a place called Ramathim, in the hill country of Ephraim. Hannah was Elkanah's first wife, but sadly she was barren. So after 10 years, he married a second wife, Peninnah, in order to have sons. Although Hannah remained her husband's favourite, and he was grieved that she was so distressed because she couldn't have children. This, of course, made her relationship with Penina, the second wife who saw her as a rival, a bit rocky. And she was mocked and scorned and treated badly by her, especially as Penina already had produced offspring for Elkanah. Every year, Elkanah, being a devout Jew, took a trip to Shiloh, one of the main centres of Israelite worship, with his family to worship and sacrifice to God. And it was during that one of these trips that Hannah, having had just about enough of Penina's nastiness, sat crying and praying in the temple. Enter stage left the priest Eli, who at first thought her to be drunk because she was praying so intensely. When she explained her situation to Eli, he prayed that the Lord of Israel would grant her prayer. And Hannah, in turn, promised that if she had a son, she would give him to God as a Nazarite. 
a temple priest who would never touch alcohol or cut his hair. It was something that was commonly done in those days. Because of the books of Samuel, we know, of course, that her prayer was answered and she had a son who she named Samuel, which means in Hebrew, the Lord hears or the name of God. When he was weaned, it suggested this would be at about six months. She kept her vow and took Samuel to Shiloh and handed him over to the high priest Eli as her offering to God. Because she did this and remained faithful to God, she was blessed with a further three sons and two daughters. Now, because the books of Samuel, which is more than a courtesy title about the main character rather than the author, because he didn't actually write them. And anyway, he dies in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 1. We know that Samuel, although starting in the temple as the lowest of low, became a man of power and influence in a period of crisis and transition for the people. He was priest and prophet, war maker and peacemaker, seer, anointer of kings, servant of God, and was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. And he played a key role in transitioning Israel from the rule of the biblical judges to the United Kingdom of Israel under first King Saul and then King David, when tribal wars threatened to tear the people apart. He's venerated as a prophet in Judaism, Christianity and Islam. But why is it so important to know all this? Because when we meet Samuel today, he's just a simple lad, about 12 years old, serving at the tabernacle, ministering to God with the priest Eli, doing things like sweeping floors. He was a faithful young servant who, although he'd been really close to God in many ways in the temple, actually knew nothing about him on a personal level. No one knew much about God on a personal level just then because we're told in those days the word of the Lord was rare. But God calls Samuel, patiently waits while he explores what's happening, gets advice from Eli and then has a conversation with him when Samuel is open to it. Choices. All day, every day, we make them, some more important than others, some just a bit of fun, but others life-changing, scary, and with consequences we don't always expect or even want to think about. All through our lives we make choices that affect ourselves and others. We decide if and where to go to college or uni. We decide if and who we will marry and when and make plans for our careers and our futures. So many of these decisions made with complete confidence, but often in blind faith. And of course, we also have a decision to make too about whether to allow God into our lives. Now, it would seem to me that we, all of us listening to this today, have already made that decision on one level or another, just as Samuel did. But I wonder, though, how many of us had helped to recognise the voice of God calling our name, as he did from Eli? I know I did. I wonder, too, on that night, did Eli want to say to Samuel, you're dreaming. Next time it happens, just ignore it. Pull the duvet over your head and go back to sleep, please. Don't keep disturbing me. Perhaps Eli was a nicer person than I am, who by the second or third time would have snarled at Samuel to go back to sleep and stop inter interrupting my beauty sleep with his dreams. Did Samuel, as we all often do, simply want to pretend he hadn't heard anything at all? Perhaps it was easier for him because he'd already given his life in the service of God. So perhaps he did understand what was happening. Or did he wonder if someone was playing tricks on him? Did he think that Eli was messing him about and in reality was calling his name, maybe testing him to see if he was alert? 
Why wasn't he frightened when Eli said, it's not me calling? I don't know, but after watching too many suspense movies, I can tell you that you wouldn't get me out from under the bedclothes with a crowbar if I heard a strange voice calling my name in the middle of the night. After all, a voice in the night almost always signals trouble. OK, both Samuel and Eli knew that Samuel had been de dedicated to the Lord and can't have been too surprised to learn that something a bit otherworldly was going on. But what is surprising to me is perhaps that God didn't just do the simple bedside visit to make sure Samuel knew what was going on and then wander off home in time for tea or send an angel as it happens in many parts of the Bible. Why the doubt? Why leave things hanging in the air? Why involve another party? It does seem a little strange, but in fact, it's no different from what most of us experience. I don't know about you, but I'm certain I didn't have a vision or even hear God's voice speaking to me so clearly that I dropped everything to do his work. In fact, I'm not too proud to say that I dragged my heels and refused to believe for more time than I would like to think. I even actually refused to become a member of the church for years because I didn't want to be tied to the building and all the paraphernalia, only to find that I'd been a church member from the age of 13. You can't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humour. Earlier, I said, I refused to believe. But actually, I meant, I refused to believe that he really wanted someone like me. But he did. And like Samuel, I needed time and help to recognise the voice that called to me because I was probably the most reluctant preacher in the history of the Methodist Church. Like Samuel, I had to learn. I opened our prayers today with a verse from what is one of my favourite psalms, number 139, which is attributed to King David. Alexander Kirkpatrick, who was a professor of Hebrew at Cambridge University and who was also third master at Selwyn College, Cambridge, wrote about this psalm that the consciousness of the intimate personal relationship between God and each person, which is characteristic of all the Psalms, reaches its climax here. Psalm 139 celebrates how thoroughly God knows his own. We heard a version of it when we heard the worship song wonderfully made by Sarah Hunt earlier. But please, Read up to and including verse 18 for yourself when you get a moment. It's truly beautiful and it has wonderful lines like, I'm an open book to you, even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. And for it was you who shaped me first inside and out. You formed me in my mother's womb. And you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. And of course, the statement that I opened our prayers with, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Though I must stress that the word translated to fearfully means it in the sense of distinct or unique. God calls us for a reason. God calls us knowing us, warts and all, and he calls us knowing that we can do what he asks, if we want. Like Samuel, we may need to be prodded more than once because our understanding of our calling may be a long drawn out process and a decision comes only after testing the call. We may even need to be pushed a little at times and often be supported by others when our doubts want to paralyse and floor us and stop us from doing God's work. 
God does not drop people randomly into this world without regard for their need or situation. He knows exactly who we are, what we're thinking, whether we're planning to hide under the duvet and ignore him or not, and what we require to have the faith and trust in him that we need. God made us special and has a plan for us to do his work, although it might not be where and when and how we expect, or even with whom we expect. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us that he made us as masterpieces for a purpose. I don't know about you, but I don't usually tend to think of myself as a masterpiece, but that's the way our loving Lord sees us. So if God has confidence that we can do his work and live like Jesus taught us, then surely we should be receptive to God's voice and listening for his call, no matter how afraid we are or how unworthy we think we are. And when we hear him, surely the only answer we can give, like Samuel, is speak I'm your servant, ready to listen. Samuel went on to be one of the pivotal characters in the history of Israel, a man of much more importance than the king. Now, I'm pretty certain we won't be asked to take on a heavy burden such as his. But when God calls us out to be his disciples, when we know deep in our hearts and souls that God is reaching out and touching our lives, then surely all we can say is, yes, Lord, take my life and everything I have, everything I am and all I can be. It's yours to do with as you will. Lord, have it all today and always. Jesus 
When I say the Lord is our hope, I would ask you to say God is our joy and strength. The Lord is our hope, God is our joy and strength. Let us pray. God of light and power and glory, we ask that you enlighten your church where its vision is dim and the light of the gospel has nearly gone out. We pray for spiritual renewal, for an increase in vision and hope. We remember all who are prophets and visionaries today. The Lord is our hope. God is our joy and strength. We ask that you direct all who are seeking to improve the world. We pray for peacemakers, for relief agencies, for all involved in scientific research, for all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that the poor may receive what is needful for their welfare. The Lord is our hope, God is our joy and strength. We give thanks for all who led us to you, all who shared their insight and knowledge, all who kept the lamp of faith burning. We pray for those who've maintained the church, for those who have been accepting and understanding. The Lord is our hope. God is our joy and strength. We pray for all who have entered into weakness, sadness or trouble this week, for all who have been injured or are sick those struggling physically or mentally with all the complexities of life today, for those suffering the effects of long COVID still, and for those who are mourning a loved one. We pray for the afflicted, the perplexed, the persecuted, and all who feel forsaken. The Lord is our hope. God is our joy and strength. We pray for all of your children in this world and ask that the afflicted will know affection, the perplexed will discover your purpose, the persecuted will come to your peace, 
The forsaken will be enfolded in love in the fullness of your kingdom. The Lord is our hope. God is our joy and strength. We pray for countries broken by war, for peoples facing ethnic violence and hatred, for all who are being discriminated against. We remember those being robbed of homes, of their land, or their livelihood. The Lord is our hope. God is our joy and strength. Lord of all, we ask that you hear these our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'm going to read a meditation from the work of Eddie Askew. It's a little bit misquoted and it's from both his books, Encounters and Many Voices, One Voice. Lord, life without you would be impossible for me, but life with you does not come easy. You make demands. Your voice is velvet soft, and one in theory I could choose to ignore. But your persistence makes resistance hard. I know I'm free to choose, and there are times I use that freedom in ways that are not yours. Sometimes, Lord, I wish you'd shout, grab me, shake me, make me listen. But then you'd be like all the others insistent, clamorous, offering quack cures for old ills, trapping me, ensnaring my thoughts in thickets of uncertainty. Lord, when I think about it, how else would you speak but in a still, small voice? Your love doesn't compel or overemphasize. You wait in the corners of my consciousness with exquisite courtesy, endless patience, loving gentleness. But with that courteous, gentle patience, you strip away the pretense, my self-deluding protest that says, I hear no voice. I hear it, Lord, more often than I want to. Sometimes I'm just not ready for what it asks. Forgive me and help me to say yes, Lord, when you call. Make the shit.
your communities. Go and make a difference. Raise up those who are disheartened. Tell others about the risen Christ. Visit those who are lonely and may your heart and mind be open to receive all that God gives to you and asks of you. Amen. Thank you for sharing worship with us today. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join with us again next week when our worship is coming from the Strathclyde circuit. I hope you have a good week. Take care. Bye.